Um, you know, I walked to the edge of the cliff um, and I came back and I am a cancer doctor. Unfortunately, I see four or five patients a week die in my clinic. And from that, from that passion is the technology we developed and I'll tell you about it in a few minutes. But it really comes from the heart of prevention. I can't treat cancer well and there's no way I'm going to in the future. With all due respect that we can sequence the genes of the cancer, and I was one of the heads of the Cancer Genome Project, I believe in that. The problem is the average cancer on diagnosis has 135 mutations. So it's going to be very hard to target an individual's mutation in most cases. There are clear exceptions, but in most cases. And so prevention is powerful. We know it's powerful because with the advent of statins from 1950 until today, there's been about a 72% decrease in death from heart disease and stroke. With the advent of anti-infectives and influenza vaccines, there's been about a 66% decrease in death from infectious disease. In that same time period from 1950 till today, there has only been an 8% decrease in the death of cancer. And so we're doing great in certain areas. And the amazing part is most of the time we don't even know what we're doing. We use Lipitor or statins because we thought lowering cholesterol was a way of fighting heart disease. It turns out statin worked, but one of their dominant mechanisms was blocking inflammation. So if you take somebody with a normal cholesterol and put them on statins, there's a dramatic effect in a heart attack and stroke, as well as a dramatic decrease in the incidence of cancer. So one of the keys in prevention is blocking inflammation. I created a company called Navigenics because the problem with prevention is, how do you know what to prevent? We all can't prevent everything. And so what Navigenics is, it's a technology where you spit into a tube, you mail it in, three or four days later you talk to a genetic counselor in concert with your physician, and you get a list today of 38 diseases, all of which are interventionable or delayable, and you learn about you. You learn your chance of things from Alzheimer's to stroke to different cancers because it makes a difference. In our country, in the United States, we do colonoscopy at age 50 because that's when those risk for work curves come together and it's cost effective and you accept the toxicity of doing a colonoscopy, which obviously isn't fun. What do you say to the 5,600 people in the United States last year who died of colon cancer under the age of 50? Well, you didn't hit those risk for work curves. No, we can now identify those populations by genetic markers and they undergo colonoscopy early. I was one of them. My grandparents and their parents before them never talked about what they died from. Disease was a dirty word. And so until Andy Grove, who's one of my heroes and my mentors, were on the cover of Fortune magazine and said, I had prostate cancer, nobody really talked about it. And so one of the things people always argue is, well, I can just get my family history. You can, but in general, it's not that accurate. And that's the role of genetics. Genetics has had a remarkable influence. This whole technology of looking at close to 3 million pieces of DNA for these correlations costs about $250 per person. So the charge is $250. It's very small cost in terms of what it was. In the 1974 Monsanto Annual Report, they estimated that it was $150 million to sequence one gene. In my lab, every night, when patients are diagnosed with cancer, they go home and we sequence on average 250 genes per patient, and that total cost is about $10 to $12. So greater than Moore's law decrease in costs and efficiency in that regard. The problem is, is that genetics are just a small piece of the puzzle. I liken it to a Chinese restaurant. If you're standing in front of two Chinese restaurants or two falafel trucks in Jerusalem, and you get the ingredient list, they're exactly the same. There's no way you, looking at the ingredient list, can tell which food is better. And so the problem with genetics is, it's your ingredient list. It tells you nothing about what's happening at that moment in time. And so newer technologies, which I'll talk about in a second, are around that we can start to add on to the probabilistic function that we get of genetics and learn more about the individual. The first is a technology called proteomics. The idea that from a drop of blood, you can get a 60 gigabyte picture of all the proteins in the blood and start to see what's going on that moment in time. Because the key is looking at the whole system. One of the key trials in cancer was published in the New England Journal of Medicine about six years ago, where they took women 
with uh, premenopausal breast cancer. It's about the worst kind of cancer you can get as a woman, people before menopause. And they randomized them after therapy to either get hormonal therapy or hormonal therapy in a drug that builds bone. They reduced recurrence by 45%. From the ad, as you change the soil, the seed doesn't grow. So the notion that we have to target the cancer is probably wrong. We can target the system. And that can be applied to many diseases. We keep talking about treating an individual symptom. In general, the new concept of actually treating toward health. If you come to me and you have cancer, your goal isn't to shrink your cancer by 50%. Your goal is to be healthy. Your goal is to live long. And the problem is we haven't had those metrics yet as we go along. One of the other new fields is called microbiomics, the study of the bacteria and viruses in your GI tract. It turns out you, no offense, have tenfold more bacteria in your body than cells in your body. And so what was known for a long time is that the incidence, for example, of breast and prostate cancer in China was on the order of about a tenth that what it was in the United States. After someone from China moved to the United States, after about a decade, it started to approach our incidence, almost 85% of our incidence. We always said, oh, it's the fast food, it's the McDonald's, it's the Burger King. It turns out that's not the case. It turns out it's the microbiome. It started as those bacteria that metabolize your food, control your hormone levels, control all the metabolites in your blood, and until really this year, we've never been able to quantify them. And now we can, and I guarantee you over the next five years, we'll actually start to manipulate them. So example, if you look in the United States at the answer to breast cancer, it goes by latitude, because bacteria change by latitude in that regard. And so I'm going to end here as the five minutes are up and just, again, leave you with this one thought, is that we want to start to treat for health and not be reductionist and start to treat an individual cell in the body. Start to look at that complex system. And I'm not negative, and I'm not negative about these therapies. In, in 2007, I was a trainee, and a 25-year-old uh, uh, kid from Plano, Texas came in with germ cell tumor in the brain, the lung, and the liver. And at the best cancer centers in the country, they told him, go home and die with dignity with your family. Chemotherapy isn't going to help you. It's going to make you sick. You have three or four months to live. Well, this kid went to Indianapolis and got platinum, the same thing that's in a wedding band, and a year and a half later won his first of seven Tour de France's. So I'm a believer in drugs. I'm a believer in what's happening. And I can't tell you today, I have no freaking idea why platinum works, but it did. So thank you.